Let me ask you a question. When you were a kid, were you afraid of the dark? Now, I actually don't know the answer to that question for my own life, but I do have a clue that I might have been afraid of the dark. You see, my parents, when I was little, they bought me a glow worm. Now, if you, like me, are a child of the 80s, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The glow worm was a very popular children's toy. Um, it was essentially a plush pajama worm that had a battery pack inside and that when you would squeeze it, its head that was plastic would light up. And it wasn't like a bright light, it was a dull, comforting, soothing light. You know, these things were so popular that there were spin-offs. There were all kinds of glowworms. In fact, there were some that sang lullabies. There were others um, that were butterflies. I mean, it was a very popular toy. They, I think they even made a TV show out of glowworms. And the reality was it, it did the trick. It was like a movable light night for, or night light for kids. Um, if you were afraid of the dark or your child was afraid of the dark and you needed something to provide comfort, the glow worm did the trick. <laughs> now, I don't know what you're thinking, but over these last few months, in the midst of the uncertainty and anxiety, in the midst of the unrest and the fear of our day, our current moment, <laughs> I have longed for something so simple to soothe me. <laughs> A mere reminder that everything's gonna be okay. And something we could hold on to that will remind us that we're not in the dark alone. We won't be in the dark forever. And so that's what I wanna talk about today. How do we respond to the darkness with hope? How do we live in the midst of all that is coming and pressing in on our lives, personally, nationally, um, culturally, and come out with hope and anticipation. Well, I think that one way we can come away with hope is to take a look, kind of a deep dive in the scriptures about what the scriptures say about darkness and light. Now, if you're familiar with this, you know, and you won't be surprised that the idea of light, whether literal or figurative light, is referenced more than 200 times throughout scripture. It's a very popular image, symbol, for Jesus, for truth, for goodness, for direction, for comfort. And so we're gonna take a look today. We're gonna to journey through some of those main marks of what the scriptures tell us about light. And what I think we're gonna come away with, what I hope we come away with, is a couple things. First, to know that God created light for a purpose. It didn't always exist, God made it. And he made it for a purpose. He made it for two purposes, actually. He wanted it to be um, a contrast to dark and to cast out darkness. And then the good news that we see in scripture, sometimes we forget this, is that just like God created light out of darkness, there will come a day when we will no longer need light as it was created. So before we dive in, pray with me. Father of light, we need your comfort, we need your hope. So we pray that you would give us um, a deep sense of your presence with us. Come Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so the first thing we wanna look at is the very first words that we find in scripture. In Genesis chapter one, we see that God is doing his work of creation. Now this is probably familiar to a lot of you, but enter in with me. Genesis chapter one, beginning of verse one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless, and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. All right, just a few observations. Maybe these are obvious to you, but just to get us rolling here. 
What I notice in this passage, two things. First, that God preceded any act of creation. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit was existing prior to any of the words of creation. And there seems, secondly, to be no angst about the darkness. God was existing just fine in his triune nature in darkness as we understood it or knew it. Because God didn't need light to see what he was doing. Instead, we needed light to see what he's done and what he's doing. So this perfectly existing union among the triune God, out of that perfect union came God's words of creation. He spoke into being. And the very first thing, the very first act of creation was to create light. Verse three says, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and he called the darkness night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God spoke light into creation. And God said it was good the light was good and dark was good. Night and day were good. God created light. He spoke it into existence. Light springs forth in Genesis 1. It's the very first created thing. So why is that important? Well, because light was good and created by God. And as we're gonna see, he created that light for a purpose, for his purposes. The other most popular passage about light comes in the book of John, the Gospel of John. The account of John, Jesus's beloved friend, of Jesus entering into creation with skin on. It says this in John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So here is John's account of the incarnation. And he begins with this phrase, in the beginning. Now, it's not coincidence. John intentionally used that verse to signal to the hearer that this story of Jesus coming is connected to the story of creation. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, the word was there. Now, John is making some bold claims here. He's making a claim that Jesus, the Word of God, was pre-existing with God in the triune character of God before all of creation. He's making a claim of Jesus' deity. He's making a claim of Jesus' identity as part of the Godhead. And he says that this God, this Jesus, who is God, was with God and was God. And he says, through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of men. So John describes the light of the world, which Jesus refers to himself in the Gospels. The light of the world coming near to the people in Jesus the creator of light, the one who spoke light into being, drew near to his people. He became incarnate in Jesus. Without Jesus, who is the light of the world, the world would continue to dwell in darkness. 
Now what's interesting here is this picture of Genesis 1 is a literal light and dark, a day and night. And what John is building on and what the narrative of scripture builds on is more than just a literal light and dark. But here there's more at stake. It's a spiritual light and dark. Because the world had been walking around in spiritual darkness and the light of the world enters the scene. The light shined in spiritual darkness. Evil was introduced to the goodness of God in Christ. Evil got a glimpse of the true goodness of God. Do you see, the darkness can see the light. It's meant to be a contrast. Light is existing so that it can show the opposite of dark. Now throughout scripture, but throughout history, light and dark have been a very common metaphor for good and evil. As if they're two um, grand forces pitted against one another eternally. Now what scripture makes clear is there is good and there is evil, but evil is not of the same caliber, they're not the same power as good. God cannot be overcome by evil. We see that in here. The light cannot be overcome by darkness. They aren't a one for one. They aren't the same powers, but different um, emphases. They very clearly evil, which has authority, has dominion, has reign. When darkness has dominion, has authority, has reign, it's limited. Because light is so much greater than darkness. Light is the revelation of God's love in Christ. And it's the penetrating of that light into the darkness of the sin of the world. Just as God, the God of salvation, dispels evil and darkness, salvation, we're told, brings light to all who would call on the name of the Lord. There's light, spiritual light that comes with salvation. So the very embodiment of God is said to be light because in him there is no sin. In him there is no disease. In him there is no destruction. He is the contrast to the sin, the darkness that we see existing in the world. Now, First John um, gives a really good picture. I'm not gonna read it, but it gives a really good image about how light and dark are contrasting. And the, the letter encourages us to walk in the light. And in it is implicit this idea that there's two paths to take. You can walk in darkness or you can walk in light, which also is all over scripture. You look at it in Psalm 1, we um, think about it in um, a couple other places that like where the choice is to walk in goodness or evil, to exist and follow the way of godliness or ungodliness. There's a contrast, there's a light and there's a darkness. And John is encouraging his readers to walk in the light, the light of salvation, the light of forgiveness, the light of the revelation of Jesus, the light of the world. This is a really powerful image. God created light to show the contrast between the darkness of sin, spiritual darkness, and the light that is found in the revelation and the salvation of Christ. Now, there's a lot of darkness in our world right now. There's hopelessness and anxiety, there's fear and uncertainty, and they're having their heyday, it seems. But John 1, 5, if we look down the passage, says the light shines in darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There's a promise here. This means that through that though sin is disastrous and has unleashed so much gloom and pain and perversion in our world, it's not going to have ultimate authority. It will not be triumphant. The darkness will never be able to snuff out and or overtake the light of Christ. 
evil will never be able to win. And we see that because God created light to see the contrast between good and evil, darkness and light. Now, not only did he create light, I think, to show us the contrast, even the way we should walk, but he gave us light, I think the scriptures flesh out, to cast out that darkness. That's what we were just talking about, that darkness cannot overcome light. But not only that, in scripture we see that light will cast out darkness. When I think about the scriptures, especially throughout Jesus' ministry on earth, over and over again, he meets people who are sick or demon-possessed in particular. And what he does is he casts out, those are powerful words, he casts out the power that is at work within people, whether it's sickness or um, demon possession. He casts out, he speaks. Remember, he speaks light into the darkness. And in that speaking light, it replaces, it fills the space of darkness. Jesus creates, recreates the light in that person's life and it casts out darkness. Now, probably the most clear depiction of this casting out of darkness we see in Jesus on the cross. So Luke chapter 24 captures, or chapter 23, captures the burial of Jesus, which is that holy Saturday, that silence between the day that he was killed and the day that he rose again. And in it captures this overwhelming sense of darkness. If you remember, darkness fell over the earth. There was deep mourning and deep grief. There was an overwhelming darkness that pervaded all of creation. It says this in Luke 23, beginning in verse 44. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he said this, he breathed his last. The, the centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness the sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Pay attention here. Look at what happens. Creation itself covers light in darkness. Do you see that for a moment, it seems like darkness has won. For a moment, it seems like evil has triumphed. I love that Luke tells us this metaphorical situation going on in the spiritual realms is captured in the physical realms as well. Because remember, God created light. So here, even the light that God created is covered up by darkness, but only momentarily, only temporarily. Because what happens later, Jesus rises from the dead at first light my friends. At first light, Jesus's body is raised from the dead. Don't you see what's happening here? Darkness covered the land that day. It seemed that darkness had extinguished the light. It seemed like darkness had overwhelmed the light. It seemed like light had been snuffed out, but the light of the world could not be overcome by darkness. Though he died, he did not stay dead. For a brief moment in history, darkness appeared to win, but friends, light has overcome darkness. Jesus is raised. This is one of the reasons why I think Paul thinks it's so important that we understand the resurrection of Jesus. He says, if we don't preach the resurrection of Jesus, then our gospel is futile because darkness would have overcome, would have won. But that's not the story Jesus tells. That's not the story or the narrative of scripture because light cannot be extinguished by darkness. 
darkness cannot overcome light, but light casts out darkness. Truth casts out lies and fear. Fear has to run. <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr. said it this way. He said, when our days become dreary with low hovering clouds and our nights become darker than a thousand midnights, let us remember that there is a great power in the universe whose name is God. And he is able to make a way out of no way and transform dark yesterdays into bright tomorrows. He is able to make a way out of no way and transform dark yesterdays into bright tomorrows. The darkness, though it seems so very dark, is cast out by light. As I was considering what to share this week, this song, I thought it was silly, but this song came into my head. Um, by an artist called Jewel. Now she sang it in the late 90s and it was a very popular song and I didn't know why this like just it just started coming in my head and so I googled it the other day and found that the lyrics to this song um, it's called Hands. It says if I could tell the world just one thing it would be that we're all okay and not to worry because worry is wasteful and useless in times like these. I will not be made useless. I will not be idled with despair. I will gather myself around my faith for light does the darkness most fear. Friends, those are powerful words. I will not be made useless. I will not be idled with despair for I will gather myself around my faith, for light does the darkness most fear. Light casts out darkness. Salvation sheds light and brings life to the body. Though the darkness around us feels maybe like a thousand midnights, we hold on. We will not be idled in despair. We will hold on to the truth of our faith. That the light of the world overcame the darkness of the grave. He overcame the power of darkness. And he cast it out because he is light. We have um, one more thing I want to talk about today, and that is often forgotten by me. But as I was diving into what the scriptures had to say about light and darkness, I was really struck by the image that we see at the consummation of all things, the story of revelation given to God's people. And I think it's easy for us to think Jesus's victory, Jesus has conquered death and the grave, and he is the light of the world. But there's also this picture of the coming of an end to light at all, which makes me realize that light had a purpose. God created light so that all that he had made could understand the contrast between good and evil, light and dark, and so that he could show us that the power of light can cast out all darkness. And we can hope in that and cling to that. We can proclaim the resurrection of Jesus and hold on to that, wrap ourselves around our faith because we know that darkness fears light more than anything else. And we have light in us. But here's this image, okay, of Revelation and the people of God. So Revelation chapter 21 is this depiction of the new heaven and the new earth. When God comes back on his throne and he inaugurates its king, his kingdom in its final stages, we see this image. It says in Revelation 21, Then I saw the new heaven and the new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw this 
holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven with, from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. I just want to stop there for a minute. The old order of things. There will be no more tears, no more crying, no more despair. Darkness will no longer affect creation. There will be no reason to cry because the effects of sin and destruction will no longer be known or experienced or felt because the new heaven, the new order of things will be inaugurated. Now listen to this. Verse five, and he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this and I will be their God and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts and idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of seven last plagues came and said to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit of the mountain, great and high, and, sh and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and the brilliance was like that of very precious jewel, like jasper clear as crystal. Now I'm going to skip down a little bit here. Notice the brilliance of the king, this Jesus. It said, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. And the nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor to it. No one, on no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Do you see that picture? The glory of the Lord is so bright. His presence with them will be their light, it says. There is no need for sun or moon to shine on it because the glory of God gives it light. The lamp is the lamb of God. And then it says, there will be no need for light. Don't you see there's this image of God's very presence, the God of light, the light of the world. When he is fully dwelling with us and we are fully dwelling with him, we will need not to have stars or moon or any light from the sun because we will have the very presence of God. And as we wait, as we long for that day when we won't need to see the contrast or cast out darkness, we hold on to our faith in the God who is the light of the world. Now, my uh, glow worm, what I didn't tell you about my glow worm was that I got mine, um, I think it was like a second edition because um, the first edition battery powered glowworms sucked through batteries like nobody's business. I mean, they just drained and drained and drained those batteries. Those poor parents who had to refill the batteries all the time, especially for the lullaby glowworms, they just thought there has to be a better way. And so my parents, they got me the one that was solar powered. Like literally I would hold it up to the light in my room. And then at night I would turn out the lights and it would glow and glow and glow and it would glow as a reflection of the light. Friends, you and I have the spirit of Jesus 
living in us. We have the light of the world dwelling in us. That we don't need to soak up our energies to create light and happiness and positivity. Because I feel like that's a temptation, right? Like we want to just think on the positive side and think the best. And we're just trying to be hopeful and muster up our strength and find light in us. Friends, we don't need to find light in us. We have light in us. We let that light shine from out, from inside to the out. But the only way that we can fill ourselves with that light is by the presence of the living God, by soaking up his goodness, knowing his word. I know that there are many of you who are watching the news all the time. I wanna encourage you, stop watching the news. Start reading, devouring the scriptures, the stories of this God of light. Let this be what your mind and your heart are focused on. Point yourself towards the word and fill yourselves with that light so that when circumstances come, because they will, because sin still has authority, darkness still reigns, limited reign, but reigns nonetheless in our world today. So I, I wanna encourage you to fill your solar powered glow worm self with the living God and his light. Disciplines of prayer, disciplines of fellowship, disciplines of scripture reading, disciplines, go to the source. Soak up the light, the truth of who God is. Because in these moments, we can be reminded that that light shines in and through us and will cast out the darkness, whether it's fear, anxiety. God has the power with his light to shed it on those places and to cast it out. You don't have to live and dwell in the authority of the darkness, but you can live as people who in the kingdom of light because God is the light of the world. He's the source of light. He's the creator of light. And ultimately, he is our light and our hope. So don't be idled with despair. Don't be made useless. But gather yourself around your faith. For light does the darkness most fear.